thank you everybody for coming along. Welcome to the Northern Institute. My name is Michael Christie. I work here sometimes at the Northern Institute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the lovely people, the traditional owners of this land, this beautiful place. And I would like to welcome Mark, who is an old friend of ours. She was at Go in Nolanbo when I was working there and when Helen Barron was working there. Uh, Mark was a student in the house and she was working with the Demoro Aboriginal Corporation, which is the group of rangers from that Demoro area, which means east and east with me from Montana. And she was working there on aspects to do with how Aboriginal knowledge and Western bureaucratic knowledge can work together um, productively. And you can still, in a sense, working on that. She's an adjunct here with us at the Northern Institute, and she is also a senior research fellow in the um, Department of Fashion and Agricultural <laughs> Sciences at the University of Melbourne. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Mark, who will tell us something about the work that she has done and that she continues to do with the All North Rangers. Thanks and very much. And she will talk for a little while, and then you have a chance to answer your questions and have a discussion. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much, Michael. And thank you all for coming, um, and to the Northern Institute for having me here today. So, as Michael's mentioned, my presentation today is about the Yungo Aboriginal organisation, uh, the Dimuru Aboriginal Corporation, um, known as Dimuru. And Dimuru spent really over 20 years developing a unique and strategic cross-cultural knowledge community that I would argue successfully aligns people, policy and practice. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about Dimuru, I will give a brief introduction next. Um, this organisation has a long and rich history. I won't be able to go into all the details of that. Um, but I will talk, as Michael mentioned, a bit about the work I did as part of my PhD and now about um, this current research project that we're doing. So I should, um, before I go any further, acknowledge my co-researchers, Jalinda Umari, Jonathan Wern and Greg Wern. So I worked for Dimru in 1994, which seems like a very long time ago now in some ways, although in others it doesn't. Um, so just after the organisation was formally instituted, I guess, in 1992, the aim of the Yungo landowners who established Dimru was to make available their estates for recreation by the residents of Nolanboy, so the mining town in northeast Arnhem Land on the Gove Peninsula, and also for visiting tourists, but on the condition that government and industry partners would support the sustainable management of their estates into the future. So young all landowners become concerned about unregulated use of their estates for camping, or for camping, yes, for a lot of recreational fishing as well as commercial fishing, and particularly the impacts of those uses. So marine debris was a big impact and still continues to be the spread of reeds and feral animals as well as soil erosion. So they resolved to form their own land and management uh, organisation, land and sea management organisation, Nimru. And importantly, they committed their own resources to employ the original rangers, an executive officer and administrative assistant. So with the support of the NLC, they also established a permit system to regulate use to the uh, access, sorry, to the Yungle lands and seas within um, the designated Dimru sort of management area. And I was employed on a land care grant to support the development of a plan of management for a particular, particular Yungo estate called Wanawoi or Cape Arnhem. And in fact, that development of the management plan in a way was Dimuru's first sort of formal attempt um, to create a, a plan of management in a form that might be recognisable by governments. So the context for this current project is the evolving policy situation of Indigenous protected area management and Indigenous range of programs nationally. Dimuru declared the first Indigenous protected area in the Northern Territory in 2000 and has since had recurrent funding from the Australian Government um, for management of what is called the Dimuru IPA. Since 2000, however, the Working on Country program 
um, which has supported Dimmeria's range of workforce as part of a national funding initiative of over $46 million, um, and which aims to have trained 730 rangers by the end of 2016. So unfortunately, there is now some uncertainty about these programs with no formal recommitment to funding beyond 2018. However, since its formal inception in 1992, Dimmeria has participated in many government and other partnerships that have influenced its development in a myriad of ways. And now seems to be a good time to take stock, to look back and reflect on the foundations of Dimmeria and what has contributed to its successes. Also to look at what challenges there have been and perhaps to rem still remain, so Dimmeria can go forward with a strong foundation for the future. project called Looking Back to Look Forward aims to explore these success factors for Dimmeroo, including how ranger work at Dimmeroo is organised and constituted, makes it up and how it's understood and valued by young people and by others. These are the members of the So we have Jami Marika, who is the current Managing Director of Dimmeroo, um, Delinda Umari, who is the Senior Cultural Advisor at Dimmeroo, Greg Wern, who was the executive officer of Dimru back in the time that I was working there. His son Wern, who's currently uh, the Learning on Country Coordinator based at, at Dimru. And this is Jawa Yunapingu, who was one of the original rangers and is now and, and worked for many years as the managing director also at, um, at Dimru. He's now moved on, but is very closely involved in this project. So following my first year, oh sorry, as part of our analysis and our thinking of, and writing about um, what it means to be a Yungle Ranger and the development of Dimru, we're going to draw on some earlier research. So following the first year that I worked at Dimru in 1994, I was employed at Bachelor Institute then from 1996 to 1998. And during this time I began my doctoral studies as Michael mentioned. I was involved through the University of Melbourne but I was also one of the first two um, students of the Gama Cultural Studies Institute and I was involved in a collaborative project which we'll talk about in a minute which also involved the Iroquois Community Education Centre. Um, my supervisors were Helen Varon, as Michael mentioned, but also Dr Yunapingu and Dr um, Marika Munungrich. Um, I've already mentioned that Greg was involved um, at that time as the Executive Officer of Dimru. So this is a photo of us at Bachelor um, at the first formal graduation ceremony for the senior Yungle Rangers at Dimru, and I think that was 1995, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and this is us at the um, formal declaration of the Dimmeru IPA in 2000 at what is now the Gala site um, at Gukla. Yeah. So I wasn't actually working directly for Dimmeru at that time, but I still had my uniform and I was up visiting, so I put it on. <laughs> um, and so while I was um, sort of completing my work at Bachelor and moving into doing my thesis, I was actually involved in a research project um, funded by the Australian National Training Association Authority, sorry, based out of CDU called JAMA and VET. And this is a, a photo of the copy of that volume. Um, and in this project, I did over 30 interviews with, um, sorry, it was looking at the development of the training um, program through DIMRU. So I worked in particular with a group of young men um, who were training to be rangers in that period from 96 to 97. Dimru had quite a big range of workforce at that point. They were unable, as quite a fledgling organisation still in some ways, to sort of manage um, that workforce. And so about eight of the um, young men who were training to be rangers in the previous year were enrolled full time in the Associate Diploma of Natural and Cultural Resource Management through Bachelor. And I was the community based lecturer at Yurikala. But as much as possible we delivered that as a workplace base and, and obviously a community based program. Sometimes the, the students and myself would come into Bachelor for workshops but as far as possible we worked closely with Dimru to deliver that curriculum. 
So from this previous research where I did about 30 interviews with the Dimmeroo trainee rangers, the senior rangers, other key landowners, etc. back in 1996, um, we're, we're using that to compare and contrast, I guess, um, the ongoing development of the Yungle Ranger role and what might have changed and also what, what might have sustained that role. So in that JAMA and VET project, and then later in my PhD studies, I sought to understand how Dimmer and its members were actively negotiating this curriculum for ranger training through, um, through the organisation. And I'd argue that the curriculum was part of this unique form of strategic knowledge work that was emerging at Dimmeroo. Um, as I mentioned, all the rangers were enrolled, um, but as far as possible, we were delivering in a workplace-based mode. And in uh, doing this thinking, I guess, I drew on approaches in science and technology studies, and in particular, a typology of knowledge practices proposed by scholars Shapen and Schaefen. And this typology conceptualises all knowledge as emergent in social, material and representational practices. So I adapted this typology and sought to identify the different knowledge practices of young or ranger training at Dimaru. And I called these journeying, naming and tracing. These journeying, naming and tracing practices are in fact exemplified in a Jungle methodology for knowledge making that was developed over many years through the work of Jungle and Napagi educators and academics. And this methodology is called Rom, and I'll talk a bit about this now. So Gautha Rom workshops are a Jungle methodology for both ways teaching and learning that have been developed over more or less the last 30 years or more through the Yirrkala and Lanapoi Homeland Schools communities and Michael's been very involved in that. Um, the methodology is based on principles of teaching concepts in English and Western maths through the use of Jungle metaphors and other processes of knowledge making. In 1995, Dimaru, the Yirrkala Community Education Centre, University of Melbourne and the Gama Cultural Institute, Studies Institute held a series of these called the Rom workshops as part of a collaborative research council and my PhD was part of that. So these um, series of workshops were aimed at um, addressing issues of both ways environmental management focused on endangered species management and fire management in particular. And the first of them was held at Darling Boy, which is a Yungle homeland about an hour's drive southeast of Norm Boy. So in this workshop, we undertook three days of teaching and learning or burning work or what was called Warut Jama, so literally burning work. And together the teaching and learning that happened at the workshop, which was of course carefully designed using the principles of Gautha Rom, demonstrates the knowledge practices of journeying in the land, naming, which is connecting places and people through kinship and ancestral activities, and tracing, which is the work of representing these journeying and naming practices in text, in images and narratives. And I'll give some examples of that now. So this is the first evening of the Warwick Jama Got the Rom workshop at Darling Boy in 1995. On this evening, Senior Jungle gave instruction on the relations between the different Jungle clans involved in this event, the land we were in and on, and Jalkari, which is the activities of the ancestors or the Wangara. Together, these systems describe how Yungle people are connected to particular wanga, the focal sites in the land and water that we were needed to know about to do our burning work the following day. So this learning of names of particular places was a critical part of doing burning work for the Yungle trainee rangers, and these are some of the rangers here, who you see there scribing these names onto a map on the veranda at the Darling Boys School. So this map is a representation of this knowledge, these names and wanga, of the stories of the ancestral beings and their constitution of these particular places, as they were told to the younger rangers by the senior young instructors and landowners. The following day, we journeyed by foot and by boat, and later by rescue helicopter, but that's another story, <laughs> to the focal sites or wanga that we'd been instructed about. In these wanga, people are connected to, to their country through guratu, kinship relationships. 
and the performance of ceremonial activities such as hunting and lighting fires. These activities are re-performing the work of the ancestors that first made these wanga and is called jankri, as I mentioned, or can, what might be translated as walking in the steps of the ancestors. Thus, the Yungo trainee rangers were being trained in Warukjama, which is to remake the foundational connections between people and their wanga, for example, by knowing the right names of the wanga and when and how to light fires at the right places by the right people. And this is a photo showing one group of, we, there were several parties involved in this Warukjama um, as they head out across the Burt floodplain to do some hunting. So then on the final day of the workshop, we packed up a darling boy and came back into the Norman boy. And this is a photo of the um, training rangers at the Jimuru office. Um, and here again, they performed the story of our burning work. They did this by generating a narrative of the water drama in journal writing, in mapping, and by describing and retelling the activities that they'd been part of the previous day on video. They were thus demonstrating that they, what they had learned by connecting up the tracing practices from Western style knowledge making with the Jung practices of journeying and naming. Demonstrating their learning on both the Jung side through participating in the firing episode, which we'd been part of, as well as through the scribing, the writing and the video practices. In this way, the Wadok Dharma was credited both through the Jung knowledge system and through the bachelor curriculum. So this earlier work is now sensitising us to what kinds of practices are emergent in the ongoing work and training of Dimuru Rangers and how these are strategically managed to produce effective cross-cultural and even award-winning contemporary Yungo land and sea management. So I'll turn once more now to the present and to our current project called Looking Back to Look Forward and suggest that paying attention to the different kinds of knowledge practices within uh, current range of work at Dimru might help us create a story about Dimru's performance as a contemporary Jung organisation. So what do I mean as story? The context for this research also includes the fact that we have been asked by the Dimru board to generate a performance story from this research. And this performance story is for reporting on the Dimru IPA to the Australian government. So there are quite rigorous requirements um, mandated under the Dimaru IPA management agreement with the Commonwealth, which includes a production of an annual report and now for the first time this year a performance story. So all of the groups around Australia that have an Indigenous protected area are asked to, to generate this story this year. And so the Australian Government have developed guidelines for this story, which you can see here. However, groups have been advised within these guidelines that they can be as creative as they want to in, in sort of um, producing this story. So given the obvious complexity and richness of Dimaru's work, how does Dimaru tell a story that is true to Dimaru's unique knowledge community and its practices? I propose that we consider telling a story that draws inspiration from the both ways methodology of Gautu Rum by recognising and communicating the knowledge practices of journeying, naming and tracing in Dimmeru's work. Why don't you change that to like two hours or two days? Yeah, I won't go on for that one. <laughs> Thank you. So, for this current research project, we've um, conducted 26 interviews uh, with Dimaru Rangers, with Dimaru board members, um, other senior Yongo community members and others to build a picture of how Dimaru's ranger work is understood and valued. And from a pre preliminary analysis, and I must emphasise it's preliminary because these interviews were completed at the end of June, um, we've identified three sets of knowledge um, and, they, and we've identified these as important to the question of what it means to be a young or ranger. And these are knowing and being known by country, being Ralpa, and mobilising the Dimmeru vision statement. So considering the practices of journey, naming and tracing that we see emergent in the Yungle trainee ranger program from the previous work, 
I suggest that applying this typology of knowledge practices can also be a helpful way to identify the kinds of practices interviewees in this current project have identified as important to your range of work. So for example, the first set of practices um, identified as critical to demonstrating Dimmeroo's performance through effective Yungle Ranger work, we've called knowing Yungle country and being known by Yungle country. And this includes, but obviously isn't limited to, the practices of talking to the Ngunnawal, so the rightful owners for the different wanga that Dimmeroo is responsible for managing. Knowing and representing your wānga, so knowing your place in Gurutu and the, the relevant stories and custodial practices for maintaining those wānga. Participating in bungu, so bungu jama being the ceremony, sort of everyday ceremonial work of being a young person. Uh, managing access to various wānga and Dimaru estates through administering permits and patrolling. So each weekend, um, rangers are rostered on to do patrols to the various recreation areas. And lastly, being known by or recognised by Yungle country. So several people that we talked to noted that Nullapal, so the old people, would know if a ranger was doing his or her work well if the country could recognise him or her. So these practices of journeying and naming by rangers demonstrate their connection to and responsibilities for Yungle country um, by being out on country and talking to and learning from the right people who have the sacred knowledge for the country and the wanga. So a second set of practices that constitute contemporary ranger work at Dimaru, um, we've called being Ralpa. So we deliberately asked people about this in our interviews, about what makes a young ranger Ralpa. And Ralpa translates roughly, as it is a very nuanced concept, um, as the idea of being a proud, disciplined and strong person. And these are some of the practices participants noted that contribute to a young ranger being Ralpa. So knowing what to do in their everyday jama, and that was about working independently and with confidence with surety about what your job was or is, being motivated, so turning up on time, getting out of bed, wearing your uniform, showing pride and leadership, and quite a few people talked about the idea of stepping up, um, being prepared to represent your, your work in various different fora, um, working together, so both as a cohort of Yungle Rangers, but also with the non-Indigenous uh, facilitators and other, others at, working at Dimaru. Being a role model, particularly to kids at the school um, who are part of the Learning on Country program, uh, which is about um, bringing together the school's community, the, the Dimaru community, um, through, again, a series of both the ROM workshops um, to, to deal with particular concepts in environmental management, maths and literacy, etc. So um, this being Ralpa is also about being prepared to translate or articulate or represent the vision for management on both the Jung or side as well as the Ballander side of Dimmeroo's work. Which brings me to the last set of practices that has emerged from our, our initial analysis and those are um, the practices around mobilising the Dimmeroo vision statement. So this is some of the words of the vision statement, it's actually quite a bit longer than that, um, and a photo of it uh, in the Dimmeroo boardroom. Um, the ability for rangers to mobilise this statement through their work demonstrates the commitment uh, to the Yungle uh, foundations of knowledge and land and sea management. It's not only prominent on the Dimmeroo website, but in the Dimmeroo boardroom, as I mentioned. However, I would argue that unlike most vision statements, it's actively and regularly evoked and invoked by Dimmeroo members as a guiding mandate for their work. So many people we spoke to without prompting, we didn't ask people specifically about the vision statement, but they mentioned this as something that helps uh, Dimmeroo do effective work. Um, it's also obviously an important way to communicate with governments and others about Dimmeroo's purpose and its foundations. Therefore, I would argue that the state both to and for the constituents of Dimmeroo as well as its partners in management. 
So there will certainly be more practices that we identify as we go on with our, our thinking, discussing and analysing. Um, and including some, I think, that rangers currently don't necessarily enact, but that people have, have already sort of alluded to um, as being important for the ongoing development of, um, I guess, Dimmeroo's vision for land and sea management. And that includes the practices of being an honorary conservation officer um, with the authority to prosecute people violating NT laws on Yonga land. And several people we spoke to did mention that. So Dimmeroo's vision is also traced in the representations of inspiration young leaders and knowers and past rangers and senior cultural advisors in, of Dimmeroo. So the Dimmeroo boardroom, for example, is dedicated to its first senior cultural advisor, who I worked with very closely on the development of the Wanawoi Plan of Management back in 1994. And there are other memorials to its past inspiring leaders, which are also prominent around the Dimmeroo office. And these are people I've all had the privilege of learning from, and I would argue whose actions are forever traced, journeyed and named within Dimmeroo. So, just to finish up, we'll continue to explore through this project the practices that are important to Dimmeroo in understanding and valuing Yungle Ranger work, the typology of journey, naming and tracing as an analytical framework is a way of sensitising us to what might be important and how to represent it both in a performance story for the Australian Government and in our telling of Dimmeroo and its range of work for the Dimmeroo board members and all its other constituents. So the performance story will strategically represent Dimmeroo's practices in a way that translates and manages difference it has to be recognisable to the bureaucrats, but also needs to stay true to Dimmeroo, its people, its places, its policies, as a modern young institution. Um, it will be a representation, I believe, of Dimmeroo's unique epistemology, which draws at least in part on Gautha Rom, even on an, in a sort of everyday basis. But beyond the performance story itself, we are challenged to capture through our other tracings, an understanding of the unique value of Yungle Ranger work and the processes and factors that have enabled it to develop and contribute to Yungle land and sea management. And to identify what these insights might mean for other Ranger programs and for governments more broadly, and this is the next stage of our work. Thank you very much. <laughs>